shortly. Please remain on the line. Mode. So, hello, good afternoon, everyone from Europe, and I'm sorry, good afternoon to girls in Asia, and good morning to those from Europe. I'm Fiona, the marketing for Europe's Consumer Product Azure. So, I'll be moderating this webinar today. I guess you have all received the email from me when you registered the webinar. And today's webinar is about implementing AQL effectively to product quality management. And I'm very happy to have my colleague Leah Owen to be the speaker. Let's move to the next slide, Leah. So Leah is currently the Inspection Customer Service Manager with European CTA. And she is basically responsible for all the inspection program development, implementation, on the quality update, claims management, KPI analysis, and to improve the service quality through internal training and the monitoring. So she has got a lot of experience working with uh, retailers, brands, suppliers, manufacturers of different sizes to implement their inspection program and improve their product quality. So we can move to the next slide. And before Leah starting her presentation, I would like to quickly introduce European Consumer Product Assurance to you. So at European CPA, we offer comprehensive assurance solutions along the whole supply chain. So we offer factory audit, covering, environmental, social, technical, and security aspects. And of course, we offer different kinds of inspection services. And with the inspection services, we have even developed an in-house platform called Using Assurance Online to provide data intelligence. I'll be coming back to the EAOL in a bit, in a while. And another strength of us is the people training. We offer different kind of people training, in, as in in-person training, virtual training, and online learning courses. Next slide, please. And globally, we are we are operating in more than 35 countries with about 300 in full house in Mecca and our auditors and auditors. And we can also move on. Next slide. And our coverage, we cover all sorts of consumer products for inspection, whether it is garments, footwear, accessories, furniture, child's products, toys, electrical or electronic items. We are able to cover them as well. Next slide, Leah. So coming back to the digital platform that I've mentioned earlier, it is an a online platform developed by our in-house IT and designed specifically for inspection. Mm -hmm. And under EAOL, we have got five modules, report library, inspection booking, and inspection calendar. And they are quite straightforward, as you can tell from their name. For sample validation, it is a function used by a few of our customers to really validate the samples when we are at the factory. And quality is the most powerful and most popular function amongst our customers. Next slide, Leah. Yeah. So with quality, it basic, basically offers you the data intelligence that you can do the filtering, sorting, to get the data on how good your performance or supplier is performing, or in what kind of feedback you are selling the most, and how are your suppliers doing in terms of benchmarking with your norm and everything. So we have already four views of inspection, uh, inspection results that you can, you can work with. The CPA inspection results are general statistics, the results based on your own decision and your supplier ranking. So it is a very useful and powerful tool that our system, customer like to use to, so that they are able to make more informed decisions. Next slide, Leah. So I'll be handing over to Leah and be back for the Q&A. Thank you. Leah, over to you. Thank you, Fiona. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar session today. Um, so the agenda on today is to basically give you the ins and out of AQL and the quality control sampling roles. So we're going to firstly go over the history of AQL and the quality control sampling roles. We're going to go into some depth about what actually is AQL and what are the quality control sampling roles. We're going to cover defect interpretation, the difference between general and special sampling levels, we're going to cover some case studies managing lots with AQL, 
And lastly, we'll, there'll be some time for you to answer, um, for me to answer some questions for yours. But before we get started with that, I would like to um, offer you the opportunity to react into a poll, which okay. Fiona will activate into our um, GoToWebinar tab here. Yep, so, so we just see. want to, okay. so we just want you to uh, get uh, some interaction with you and let us know why you want to join this webinar. Right, so more than 70% of people, or 75% have voted already, so let's see the results. Mm. So most of the, more than close to 60% of our participants indicate that they are hoping to develop their knowledge in terms of QC. I guess this is a very reasonable situation because we are <laughs> talking about AQL, and I hope you'll be able to really gain more information or knowledge on this after our webinar. So we, let, we can move on to the second pool, Ria. Just a very quick question, asking how often do you use the AQL standard? I guess it is also quite an overwhelming system, I guess. Again, let's see the results with more than 75% of people voted. So I guess, Leah, again, it's a very predictable answer. More than 80% are using AQL actively. I guess for the remaining 70%, I see some people are coming from the university or academic. So I guess maybe later when you enter the fashion industry, you'll be able to really use the knowledge you have gained, you gained from this webinar in your job. And we can see the last group. And let's see the result again. Also, another interesting result with about 20%, one fifth of the people saying that they are doing, they are implementing, using AQL and sampling level very effectively. We have a very confident, yes, absolutely answer. And, but I guess with, with the remaining 68% and the 11%, uh, if you need any help, you can come to us anytime. Otherwise, we can also go back to the content and maybe after the webinar, you'll be able to better manage your AQL and sampling. And anything you would like to add on this, Leah? Um, no, it's really, really interesting um, feedback, actually. So I hope today's webinar can actually give some guidance and information to people. Um, but if not, then obviously, like you said, there's time yet to ask any questions. Okay, so we can carry carry on with the Great. Okay, so first but you are not the slide is missing, I think. 
the presentation. Can you try sharing it again? Hello, Leah. Yeah, okay, so we are good. So I will pass yeah. over to you and be back later. Thank you. Okay, so we're on first on the agenda is the history of AQL and the quality control sampling rules, which we feel is really just really, um, important actually to understand where the rules were established and when. So, as you may know, um, during product inspection, AQL, which is also known as acceptance quality limit or acceptance quality level, is commonly adopted in the industry as a sampling standard. So, quality control sampling rules and AQL were both developed in the early 1930s by two gentlemen named Harold F. Dodge and Harry G. Romick. And they were, it was fine-tuned by these gentlemen and other modern quality control pioneers over the years. So here are the two gentlemen, as mentioned previously. Now, during World War II, Dodge had an office in the Pentagon, and he even served as a consultant to Secretary of War and even to NASA. The sampling rule and AQL theory was originally applied by the US military, and they did this to test bullets during World War II. And the aim was to basically avoid shipping malfunctioning bullets to the front line, which of course would have been very catastrophic. So based on the extensive work by the American military during and after World War II in 1963, the standard for sampling procedure, acceptation rules, and the tables for inspection, which are based on robust statistic calculations, were issued. Now this first standard was called Military Standard 105, abbreviated as MIL STD 105. Now this, as you can see, is the, one of the first AQL um, and sampling rule tables. You'll see as we progress in the presentation how these adapts and changes to suit the needs of the future of quality control. So this was further modified in 1989 as MIL-STD-105E. And again, in 1995, redesignated as ANSI ASQZ 1.4. Now, for your information, ANSI means American National Standard Institute, and ASQ means American Society of Quality. Now, this standard was modified yet again in 1999, this time by the International Standardization Organization. It's renamed ISO 2859, and as for all practical purposes, these three standards are all exactly the same. So now we've covered the history and how it was established, what actually is AQL and what are quality control sampling rules? So it is really important to understand the two notions because they are very, very, very different. AQL gives the accepted quality level, it does not at all give the sampling quantity. The sampling quantity is actually determined with quality control sampling rules, which are also found in the military standard. Now, AQL is defined as the quality level that is the worst tolerable. It represents the maximum number of defective pieces beyond which a batch of production is rejected. So nowadays, AQL and quality control sampling rules are widely accepted as an effective approach to random sampling during a homogeneous production lot with calculated risks for customers and suppliers taken into consideration. And it lays out a quantitative reference to both buyers and suppliers on how many defective products are accepted under one inspection according to the AQL and sampling rule guidelines. And I'll go into much more detail later about the risks involved in inspecting with homogeneous lots and inspecting with salted lots. So as you may know, AQL is usually split between critical, major and minor defects. So, for examples here, a critical defect, um, in particular in um, consumer goods and toys products, it would be critical if a legality logo was missing, a CE logo or the WEEE -E -E logo. A 
major defect, here an example for the garment or soft line industry, would be a broken or skipped stitch. And a minor defect, again in the consumer goods industry, would be a soft flash of plastic. Uh, for an example, um, if AQL for defects is a standard 2.5 for a major defect, this means that no more than 2.5 defective pieces in the whole order quantity will be accepted. So as you can see here, this is um, an adaptation of the sampling and AQL rule table. So nowadays there are basically two tables, not one. And the first table um, is the sampling level table. From here you can find out your code letter to use. So once you know your sampling level, and according to your production lot, you match up your code letter. So here, if you follow my example, I assume your lot size is between 3,201 pieces to 10,000 pieces. And you're inspecting with inspection level 2, which is the standard. And consequently, your code letter would be L. Now in the second table, the code letter will give you the sample size and the maximum number of defects that can be accepted. So our code letter is L. This means you'll have to draw 200 pieces randomly from the total lot size. And now assuming your AQR level is 2.5 for major defects and 4.0 for minor defects, therefore these are the limits. So the product's accepted, um, you can have no more than 10 major defects and no more than 14 major, uh, minor defects. Now, for example, if you find 15 products with major defects and 12 products with minor defects, this means that all products are refused and the inspection is failed. Another example, if in this lot you find three major defects, and five minor defects, this means the products are accepted and so the inspection is passed. Now however, in some situations you could come to a blank cell. So in this case our code letter is N, this means we pick sample size of 500 pieces. Now you need to find out what your allowance for minor defects are in a 4.0 AQL level. If you go down here, you can see the blank cell, and you basically take the numbers from the above. So the maximum number of minor defects allowed for this lot size would be 21. Now, like the interpretation of defects, it's obviously very common for buyers to hold varied levels of strictness and expectation in their product's quality. And now this leads to varied AQL level settings. So under normal inspection, um, the levels range from 0.4, 0.65, 1, 1.5, 2.5, 4, and 6.5. Now the larger the AQL level, the more lenient the inspection. So as said before, the sampling level and AQL are very different, but they do go hand in hand. If you want to inspect more pieces, you change the sampling size. And if you want to increase your quality level, you increase the AQL. And the reliability is determined by the sampling size, and the quality requirement is based on the AQL. I'm going to cover some examples here. Um, so for an order quantity of 3,500 pieces, and we have two examples here, so one lot and another lot. So the first example we follow is inspection level two with a sample size of 200 pieces. The AQL is standard 2.5 to 4.0. In the second example, the inspection level is one and the sample size therefore 80 pieces. And the AQL is being kept the same as the first example. Now this means, so as you may increase the pieces inspected, um, you keep the same AQL and that'll help you to have more reliable conclusions after the inspection. But I must, must um, insist it does not increase the quality level because the AQL has remained the same standard in both examples. 
The more pieces you inspect, the more reliable. In this example, we've kept inspection level the same, level two. So in both examples, the sample size is 200 pieces. The AQL in the first example is standard, 2.5 by 4.0. Yet in the second example, the AQL has been tightened, so it's 1.0 to 4.0. Now, this means that in terms of quality, the second example will be more demanding, but the reliability of the inspection all remains the same across both examples. For example, um, one, the maximum amount of defects allowed is 10, whereas the maximum allowed defects in example two is five. So as you can see, the quality is a lot stricter here. And of course, you can increase both sampling level and AQL, and in that case, you'll increase your quality requirement and you increase the reliability of the inspection conclusion. So for this sample here, the sample size is 315 pieces, yet the AQL is 1.0 by 2.5, which means seven major defects are accepted and no more, and 14 minor defects are accepted, but no more. So defect interpretation. Now, of course, different buyers may have different interpretations of defects, which are further classified as critical, major, and minor. And usually buyers specify that expectation in the defect definition, in their inspection protocols, in their quality manuals, for example, to use for the inspection execution. Now, three types of defects, as we went over before, I'm just going to give you more um, an in-depth definition. So a critical defect is a defect that fails to meet mandatory regulations and or it affects the safety of consumer end uses. Major defects, a defect that leads to failure or reduction of product usability or saleability to a large extent. And a minor defect is usually a defect that shows a deviation from quality standard, but is not likely to reduce usability or saleability of the product. Some more examples here. So a needle found in a pair of trousers is always considered critical because obviously it's very unsafe and it means um, adult trousers, child trousers, it doesn't matter, it's always critical. A malfunction battery in a remote control is a major defect because of course it will affect the use of the product. A scratch mark on a wardrobe would be a minor defect. Now of course it's slightly a visual defect that does not um, affect the usability or the saleability of the product. So understanding general and special sampling levels, because you may have seen earlier that there's two different types of levels in this table. Now the HR guideline obviously consists of these two levels. The latter, special inspection level, as the name suggests, is adopted mainly for the special purposes. Now this can include um, destructive checking, specifically in the toy industry, where you need to obviously check the safety of toys. You'll adopt this sampling level, so you have a set number of pieces tested for each test. And there are three sub-levels in the general inspection levels. So we have level one, level two, and level three. Level one represents the reduced inspection level. Level two is the normal standard, and level three is the tightened sampling. Now the ratio of sampling size to lot size increases from L1 to L3, but in most cases of mass consumer products, level one and level two are used for the normal inspections, and they are the standard. So managing lots with AQL, and we're going to cover some case studies here. So how actually is a lot considered? Now the AQL standard has been created for a homogeneous lot, and this means that among the lot, the quality is the same because the production process is the same. So therefore, to have a control of what is representative of the full production, we should ideally only inspect together the same production batches, and by this I mean the same style and the same colour. 
if you decide to break different colors of the same style into different inspections, you are breaking the rule of homogeneity and therefore the inspection will be less representative of the whole production. Now to help explain this, on the left is the same style and the same color. And of course, on the right, same style but different color. If you decide to mix different references in the same inspection, you're going to decrease the level of representativity. Of course, it is a matter of balance between the representativity of the inspection and the cost of the control. And if you must make a choice between the different rules, it's highly recommended to inspect each reference and color separately which will help obtain a representative result of the whole production. So, if you decide to mix colours or references, or if one colour or reference has fewer quantities than the others, then you have a risk of not detecting problems of this specific colour. Or you can actually penalise the colours which are good in terms of quality because you're rejecting a whole lot for one single defective colour. So to help explain this, we have an example here. So we have a reference with three colours and we're following level two, the standard. Colour A is 700 pieces, colour B has 900 pieces, and colour C has 400 pieces in the order quantity. So effectively, this means the sample size is 125 pieces. Now to split the ratio between these three colours, we would then inspect 44 pieces for colour A, 56 pieces for colour B, and 25 pieces for colour C. So in a real-time um, inspection, in colour A, we found one major defect, and in colour B, we found one major defect. Yet in colour C, we found major defects. Um, as you can see in the table, seven altogether major defects is accepted, which means the inspection is passed. But you need to remember that we only inspected very few pieces of this colour. And if you had an order quantity of just this colour of 400 pieces, the sampling level would change. So for level two, we would only inspect 50 pieces for this colour if it was an order quantity by itself. And this means that the maximum amount of major defects allowed would be three. So if we inspected only this colour in one order, in one inspection, and we achieved the same results, this means the inspection would be failed because the five major defects has broken the three major defect allowance. Just back to this example, we're going to go forward with this again. So, colour A, 700 pieces, colour B, 900 pieces, colour C, 400 pieces, for a sample size of 125 pieces. But this time, colour A and colour B each have one major defect, yet colour C has six major defects. And as mentioned before, seven was the maximum allowed major defects. So this inspection would be failed. Of course you can decide on this failed report to actually accept colours A and B. But as you've actually only inspected 44 and 56 pieces of those two colours, this sampling is not really enough to consider it a representative of those two colours. Other defects could have been missed by inspecting only those two colours. Now here's the chance to ask any questions. So if anything's been unclear during my presentation, if there's anything unanswered, then you may go ahead and type your questions into the question box in the go through webinar pop-up, and I will answer them by speaking freely to you. Okay, thank you, Leah. And I'll let you take a short break, and we have got a couple of questions on hand, but let me also go through them one by one. So one of the questions we have is about, about the inspection standard one and two. One of the participants would like to understand 
or would like to ask you to explain the difference between standard one and standard two again. Okay, so here um, I must make clear that sampling levels one and two and three do not control the quality. They only control how many pieces are being inspected. Um, so actually, it does not increase the quality level at all. It just increases the, or decreases or increases the reliability of the inspection. So with level one, you would inspect less pieces. Um, level two is the standard, but level three is a tight, more sampling level, so you'd inspect more pieces with level three. Mm. Okay, thank you, Leah. And another question, the next question is about, can you explain the double sampling plan for apparel? Sorry, can you say that again, Fiona? Ah, it is about, can you explain the double sampling plan for apparel? Are you able to catch me? Sorry, yeah, I'm having a bit of difficulty there. Ah, the double sampling plan for apparel. So there oh, so, yeah. yeah, so for example, the single plan is, um, as per um, explained. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you have explained single sampling plan, so can you also explain the double sampling plan? Yeah. So it just basically means it went two times the amount of samples I collected and inspected. So um, if you have, thinking of examples, to kind of, it's hard to explain without an example. Um, yeah, it basically means if, if, if it's required to have two times the samples, um, let me just see if I can find an example to actually show it properly. So maybe an example, if you have a lot size of 9,000 pieces, um, you would have, the, so the first sample size would be 125, and then you'd have another set of sampling for 125. Um, Or maybe you can follow up this email, uh, this question. Yeah, I think I would prefer to actually give a be big, uh, better um, example for that. So I'll yeah, follow so that up with an email, please. Yes, yeah, no worry. And the next one, we can take another one about the inspection of sets. So meaning that there are, uh, like example, for example, there are uh, three, three pair of socks sold together in at one set. So if the sampling size is 125 pieces, should it be 125 set or just any 125 pieces out of all the box? Um, that's entirely up to the customer. So we can actually, um, so we can, pieces can be counted. So one piece, uh, you know, we can do, so within a set, we can do individual pieces or one set can be classed as one piece. So that's entirely, that's a rule that's up to the customer entirely, but usually the standard is, so one pack of socks would be um, one piece. Mm, okay, so that is that. So we have got quite a lot of questions, and uh, the next one you can also read through. And what is the better choice between increasing the sample at the same level or changing it to the Titan sample level, to level B. I guess the participant is asking if they want to do a stricter inspection in terms of the quality.
Okay, today it is better to increase the sampling level or changing to the uh, level B inspection. Okay, so so yeah, it sounds like the the first inspection was failed, and they want to increase the. Yeah. Or maybe he's trying to just do the first inspection, and if he wants to have a stricter control, control on the quality. Yeah, if, yeah, if you want to cover more pieces, then obviously you use the Titan sampling level, so you use um, level three. Um, and then you can keep standard quality if you, if you don't want to tighten the quality level too much, the quality control too much. Um, I think it's always yeah, it's always good to inspect more pieces if you want a better representativity of the inspection. But of course, um, if we tighten the inspection level, it'll mean we inspect more pieces, and therefore it'll affect the cost. It'll mean the the cost of the inspection could be higher because we've gone over the amount of pieces we can fit into one man day. So again, it can yeah, it depends on the the cost that is required. Mm. Okay. And the next one is about, um, so is there any difference if I use the AQL on inspection for the garment or for toys? Um, no, there's no difference in terms of the AQL. So you can use the same AQL if you wish. You could use the standard 2.5, 4.0, or you could use a more tighter quality control. So you could go 1.5 to 4.0 the major defects and minor defects respectively. But usually um, for consumer goods and toy manufacturers and um, consumers, we actually use the special level, the control level. So we use S1, S2, S3, S4. Usually we use S4, um, and this is just for the toy testing. So the toys obviously need to be going to a bit more depth, and it's really important to test the, test the toys very well. Um, because of course it'll affect the, the safety of the toy. It has to be used by a child as the end use. So usually we use a level two for the, just the general um, control, but then we use a special sampling level for the control of the testing. Mm, okay. And the next one is about. So it is also another rather long question. So the question is, some of my customer request me to apply for tolerance on critical defects, 0 0.65, but I usually or mainly apply 0. So is there a tolerance for non-legal or dangerous defects? I guess it means defects against the safety compliance. Um. Yeah, usually it's a zero um, tolerance for critical defects because this means that um, it will fail the whole inspection immediately, no matter how many, how little we have uh, major or minor defects. So again, it just depends on the customer itself, but the standard is zero percent tolerance on critical defects. Mm. And right, the next question. So what, what happens to the product if they fail the inspection? inspection? Um, again, that's up to the customer. Usually with major defects, we remove them from production. Whereas minor defects, we allow them back into production. And then it's up to the customer to arrange with the factory what they want to do with these defective products. Um, with uh, some majors, um, the factory could repair them and then place them back into production. So then no quantity is lost. But sometimes uh, major defects are completely, you know, irreparable. Um, but that's nothing to do with the inspection company. That's uh, communication between the customer and the factory on what they need to do with these products. Mm, okay, thank you. So we have got two questions asking about non-homogeneous slots. So because we have used the example of a homogeneous slot, not to explain. So two of the participants are asking about, so can you give also examples on non-homogeneous and how the uh, inspection can be arranged in terms of applying the AQL and the sampling size? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so for 
homogeneous lots, um, so non homogeneous lots, sorry, that could be, um, so it's a different style and different colour. So you could have a, like two t shirts, but different colours, like we said before, or you could have completely different styles or different style name um, from different orders as well. Um, that's also another example of homogeneous lots. Um, so can you repeat the last part of the question, Fiona? Yeah, and then how how is the defect or the, uh, the sampling size arrangement error for non-homogeneous lots? Okay, so... Um, so the example, okay, so take other kinds of samples. It's exactly the same, it doesn't really matter what you um, actually inspect. Um, the rules for AQL and sampling levels are always the same. Um, so you could inspect two completely different types of shoes in one um, inspection. This would be a non-homogeneous inspection. So you could have a flip-flop and you could have a boot, obviously, two, obviously very different styles. Um, and it goes the, same, goes the same there. So you have, you combine those two order quantities together. Again, we're ignoring that there are even different styles here because we're going against the rules. So you have two order quantities. And then again, we split the ratio between the sampling level, the sampling size, and treat them just as, treat them like they're the same. doesn't matter how many defects the boot has or how many the flip-flop has. If one fails, they all fail. So if, mm. for example, for the leather boot, you might have loads of leather defects, and this could affect the flip-flop, which is a very basic product, which could be easily passed if it's inspected by itself. But yeah, the defect piece will always, always affect the you know, OK piece. Hmm. OK, thank you. And again, we have got two similar questions asking about, do you or do we apply the same AQL standard for measurements and the defects, or we, we can use different AQL for the different criteria? Um, for measurements, you can pick a special sampling size if you wish. Um, which obviously is like a smaller sample size. But generally, um, for apparel, for example, we measure roughly about three pieces per size or five pieces per size. We don't follow AQL for that um, or the sampling level for that at all. Um, for, for consumer products, we could usually measure or and weigh around 10 to 20 pieces. But yeah, like I say, it doesn't follow the, the sampling rules. Hmm. And the next one is about uh, yeah. So how do you decide the sample size for the different colors? Okay, so in my example we had the sampling size of 125 pieces and each color had the different ordered amount. It might help. I'm going to go back onto my previous slide if that's okay. Just to help. So here, we have 125 pieces. And the order quantity for A is 700, B 900, and for C it's only 400. Now we inspect most pieces of those 125 are inspected for B because the order quantity for B is bigger. Now you have to obviously pay attention to your quantity just to make sure, although it's not following the rules of homogeneity here, we need to make sure it at least follows some sort of standard. So if the, we wouldn't inspect more pieces for color C, for example, because the order quantity is the smallest. Mm. Okay. And okay, so that one, <coughs> It's about the next question is about I guess it is about the inspection of on of a electronic or electrical items. So mm. is missing C E mark a really considered a critical defect? What is um, the actual oh, sorry. You, you can just finish the first mm. question first. Yeah. So 
Yeah, in the European market it is because it goes against the um, against it, the law. It's European law that this mark must be on products that have a consumer use, um, and without it, it's not certified to be used legally. So, of course, um, other different countries have different regulations, but for sure, for Europe, the CE mark is it, it's the must. It, it's critical without it. Yeah, I guess because the first, the second part of the question is if the product is designed and manufactured to manufactured to comply with the legal requirements, what is the harm of having no CE mark to the consumer? I guess, like Leah has said already, the CE mark is a legal requirement. So if you want to import yeah. to the European market, you must have it. Whether your product is in line with all the design requirements under the European regulations, you still have to have the mark yeah. on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then the next one is, what is the exact meaning of AQL 2.5? Does it mean the batch might have 2.5 percentage of defect? Yeah, generally that's the meaning of um, 2.5 of the whole um, inspection lot. Um, it's, yeah, it's only 2.5% can be accepted with major defects, for an example. So, yeah, mm. that's right. Mm. And then the next question, again, relevant to the, uh, the single or double inspection. So, it is better to apply simple, I mean, I guess it means single here, or the double square root or pattern is of the inspection on cardboard. Um, so if you want to double square root, obviously we pick more um, cartons, we pick double the amount. So if you want a more, I guess that's even more reliable because you're covering more cartons. Um, and therefore, I mean, we'll be picking less pieces out of those cartons because it's a double square root. Um, if, you're sim if it's just the standard square root of export cartons, then we'd be, you know, picking those 105 pieces from 10 cartons, for example, but for double, we'll be picking less pieces and spreading it out across more of those cartons. Mm. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple of more questions on hand, so let's try to finish them. Uh, next one, can a buyer choose to get to choose what he consider a minor and major defect? Um, yeah, of course. Um, we get this quite a lot where you have your own standard for defects. So for some customers, for example, an uncut thread will be a minor defect if it's sort of below 0.5 um, centimetres. But for some other customers, it's you know, zero tolerance for uncut threads um, and they class it as a major defect. So yeah, it's completely up to the customer and how it depends as well how strict they want to be in terms of quality. But yeah, of course, if you have any certain standards in regards to defect classification, then you can just let us know and we'll ensure this is um, actioned in the inspection. Okay. And then the next one is how can as a buyer can how can as a buyer we can explain to our customer that a defect can be minor or major? depending on the position of where the defect is happening? Um, yes, yeah, so if we're talking about a, let's go more of a consumer goods, so cause it's different for different types of products. If you have a ceramic bowl, for example, um, a scratch could be major on the outside of the bowl, but on the base it could be minor because that area is not visible usually to, um, to the consumer. Um, in products, so like in apparel, um, usually the front is anything on the front or anything visual, really, really visual is um, usually major. If you find an uncut thread on the inside of a garment, it will always be, it could be minor, but on the outside, an uncut thread could be major. Um, again, it just depends on the the kind of specific classification that the customer wishes to have, but that's the general idea. Mm. Okay, so let's finish maybe two more questions. Uh, how do I improve my good quality to my supplier? 
you improve goods quality. Um, so if you're getting really bad quality results with your suppliers, um, so you're obviously getting a lot of failed reports in terms of quality, um, we can actually give you a service called Quality Access, Fiona mentioned before, and we can even go deeper into that and find out specifically what exactly the suppliers are failing, the actual quality reasons we can analyze um, into our quality system. And then we can present that information to you and give you a supplier ranking. So you can actually see very well which suppliers are um, performing well and which aren't. But of course, if you're really struggling with your suppliers and the quality is not good, um, then you should really be inspecting more pieces. So you should increase your sampling level um, to ensure that more pieces are being yeah, inspected for their quality. Um, but you should probably keep just the standard quality level because you know, if they're failing at the moment, you want to really ensure that this quality level is passed before you start making the quality level more strict. Mm. Okay. So let's take our last question before we finish off the webinar. And this participant is asking, so her companies also arrange inspection when the goods arrive at their warehouse. So should they use a stricter or a more lenient AQL and sampling time? Um, okay, so the so okay, so the flyers organizing in the warehouse. Um what well, I mean it's it's been if we were to inspect it, it's still been still manufactured in the same place in the same factory. So the AQL can remain the same, but to get a better reliability of that inspection, you should definitely increase sample size just to get a more like a better view on what exactly is being inspected. Um, because you you know you want to be able to trust your supplier. Um, but yeah, to make, give peace of mind, definitely increase the reliability, which means increase the sampling level. Mm. Okay, so we have answered all the questions. I hope you are happy with what, uh, what we have provided you with the answer. And clearly, we can go back, uh, go to the last slide so that we can close the webinar. Yes.